this whole issue became more to light by the road show. The road show, when it first started out, basically told everybody, don't touch anything. Because, yes, there's no question, my grandfather and my father used to carry a pocket knife with them. And if they found items back in the 30s and the 40s, they had took their pocket knife and they would scrape to see what the, the wood was underneath. So they could bring it back and have the old paint taken off by our cabinet maker because nobody wanted paint. It probably is probably under more question and more scrutiny all the time every day about what to restore, what not to restore, how to restore it, should we restore it, how does it affect value, does it affect value, and so it's a question that we get asked all the time. And sometimes it's a puzzle, it's a dilemma. We don't really know all the time what to say because actually it's, it's an uncertain business. It's, a, it's something that is strictly a judgment call many times. So styles change, knowledge change, and what's in and what's out changes. It is a really fine example of the Chapin School, but it has some restoration. You'll find a board, a top, out, made out of three and sometimes even four boards, but wood still shrinks. So what happens is when it starts to shrink, it starts to warp because these cleats are fighting the grain that's going this way versus this way. And what happens is it starts to warp. So what somebody did, they took the cleats off and they put a little spacer to eliminate the shrinkage, which eliminated the warp. Mm -hmm. That little spacer right up here has devastated the value of this table right now. Other than the fact that it's also refinished, which is unfortunate, if we start at 100%, if this table was untouched, with the original finish, no spacer, everything else, no cracks, no damages, it's a $25,000 table. That little spacer and the fact that it's refinished now makes this table worth $6,500, and it's been here two years. The block has left an impression where it rests and it seals the, the underside of the top from the air and the oxidation. So you're getting all this character and you're getting the real life story of the table. The beautiful wear around the edge and even the accumulation of fly specks. Really important aspect for antique feet and teakers to know is that flies will do their business and they leave little piles and these piles will have texture. And so underneath the tops of tables, behind frames, behind mirrors, what you really want to see is this accumulation of age including the accumulation of fly specks. And you can actually really feel them and see them, but you don't get that sense of age and accumulation of age uh, that once that original surface is removed or tampered with. And if you didn't want your stuff to look shabby, like the candle stand that Kevin just handed out with beauty marks on the top, you would send your pieces down to the cabinet maker to have them refinished. Mm -hmm. We find very, very few pieces of Chapin furniture that have ever survived untouched mm -hmm. because they got dirty, they got dark, the varnishes got old, crackler, it didn't look so good after a while. They sent it down to the restorer and this is how it came back. The chair is how it came back. That is a terrific Chapin side chair. It even has the original seat frame. That's great. With the original Mm. Webbing, sackcloth, handmade nails, everything. This belongs in a plexiglass box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the chair has been refinished for the same reason this was. It's unfortunate, but it's a great example. And this chair is $3,000, which uh, a Chapin chair just sold in New York in January for $150,000, only with ball and claw mm. feet, because it was untouched. It's one of those few that escaped uh, the hands of an over-aggressive cabinet maker who at the time was doing the right thing. Nobody wanted the old surface, so why not refinish it? Bring it back to what it looked like when he made it.
exactly another like frame it. just like this put it in there. and upholster and put this away and because as soon as you sit on it, <laughs> yeah. he's already done it. Here you are. See? Okay. See how quickly they made it? That's what, that's what we have done with these two chairs. There's only five of these chairs known to exist. They were made in uh, Litchfield County. They are very rare survivors with the shell, hard shell, mm. and white carving on the back, ball claw feet, uh, mm. and Kevin will tell you the history of the company. It's owned by uh, General Heeman Swift of Cornwall, Connecticut, and the seat frames are inscribed H.M. Swift, mm. and they uh, descended in his family. He ordered these chairs, possibly from Stratford, at the end of the Housatonic River and then went up the river. Uh, but it's possible that they were made in, in Woodbury. The ball and claw feet really show the characteristics of... Uh, a guy by the name of Elijah Tracy. And he made furniture for John Trumbull. And we recently had the opportunity to acquire this high boy and I, I had to stop myself from sliming my sleeves because I just loved this piece. But I wonder whether Elijah Tracy would be pleased the way it looks right now. And that is because it has the original surface. And that piece probably would have been made around 1750. Mm -hmm. Compositionally, it's a jewel. The legs are fantastic. And the apron and the brasses, it is absolutely untouched. It's untouched. It is just gorgeous, great proportions. And it's got this old crackler, bubbly surface, which I'm sure if the original cabinet maker saw, he'd say, what? So when my grandfather and my father years ago, they would have refinished it, no question. Because nobody would have bought that back in the 40s, the 30s. Nobody. Nobody. So as a piece got old and shabby looking, because the first pieces were finished in either beeswax, shellac, and these finishes broke down. Shellac is not real durable, and it started to break down. It got a little shabby. They didn't want their neighbors down the street that they couldn't afford to fix up their furniture. So they took it down the cabinet, or they did the remedy themselves. They took a coat of varnish, and they slapped it on. And for the first 10, 20 years, it looked great. It looked great, but then, the later varnish did not adhere over the long term to the beeswax surface or the shellac and it started to separate sort of like oil and water or like sour milk. It started to look really nasty and that's what it is now. But I'm sure that the cabinet maker who made that would, he would just never understand why we're leaving it like that. And that is because it tells the history of the piece. It is what we call the paint history, or the surface history. And this was brought upon, I think, because of a paranoia that if every piece on the, on the high board, the legs, and the draw fronts, and the molding, didn't all have the same consistent surface, you could easily tell, ah, the draw fronts replaced, because it doesn't all have the same bubbly, crackly surface, which is historic, might confuse especially the new, the novice collector. They come in there and they look at something like that and they think, I wonder why in the world they're asking so much for that piece when this one over here, they can see the cherry beautifully on it. And that was probably an old washback surface, probably done a hundred years ago, very conservatively. It was not scraped, it was not sanded. Somebody just probably took off the later crack on our surface so it doesn't retain, even though that is one of the greatest flat top Connecticut high boys that exist. There's a cabinet maker here in Connecticut by the name of Robert Leonetti. He is the son of John Walton, who was a very well known antique dealer. John Walton declared that the finest Connecticut high boy, flat top high boy that exists. And I have to agree with him. Those legs are to die. They're fantastic and everything about that. But it has not sold because it doesn't have this surface. If that high boy had that surface, it would have been under great demand and it would have sold by now. 
But that hardwood, unfortunately, has what we call a washback surface. To me, form is more important. I don't care how great the surface is. If the form is bad, it's still bad. It will always be bad. You can't fix an ugly leg. <laughs> it's unfortunate that it is not the original surface. It's unfortunate that it is not the original surface. Now, Arthur, I wonder whether you can um, get some sort of calibration of restoration that, um, for example, would not deteriorate the price of the value. That I'm glad you asked that question. Because I'm ready for it. Keep going. I'm ready for the, I'm ready for that question. <clears throat> you know, one thing I, I think about is the John Townsend chest. That That's exactly what I was going to say. We decided it's Townsend's, and, but it had no feet. The feet were gone. And, and so it was, after a lot of research, they decided that this bun foot should be made and adhere to the secretary. And Kevin and I actually had the opportunity to tear this piece apart. And the silver brasses and all the fittings were made by Samuel Casey, of Little Neck, uh, Little Rest, Rhode Island, who was a great silversmith in Rhode Island. Uh, he worked together with the daughter to the Townsends on this piece. And that piece brought, I think, 11 or 12 million dollars. The point is, it had no feet. And the feet that were made for, the Sotheby's made for, were really odd, and nobody really knows. Albert Sack and was like a surrogate father to me, and he used to say, if a piece is great enough, and important enough, you can overlook losses, damages, restorations. You have to look at the whole piece in unity. The paint is now at such a great character to the bird, to the weather vane, that it really adds the value to the piece tremendously and really makes it a one of a kind work of art instead of a weather vane that was hammered out in a mold in a factory. So restoration means you would want to bring this back to the copper surface. Mm -mm. If you try to do that, you'll be really you diminishing the value. Mm -hmm. So this is really the perfect candidate for preservation Preservation. and conservation. You want to keep this paint as intact as it is, and you want to keep it in as good condition as it is now for the rest of uh, its life. Sure. This was probably made of the Gaines School in Ipswich, Massachusetts, as early as maybe 1720, 1730. There is an account book known at Winterthur, dated 1706, I think, of John Gaines, and it's the Holy Grail. I mean, my heart stopped when I got into that apartment. I thought, oh my God, this is a great Gaines chair. But we find out that the chair is all pieced up. The legs are restored this chair was just sold in January at Christie's and brought $450,000. It is, and it could be the sister of this one. He could have made this the next week. But because this chair does not have the absolutely mag most magnificent feet ever on a Gaines chair, that kills the value probably. It's not even 10%. This chair isn't worth $45,000. And maybe it's 5%. Maybe the chair is worth 4500 That's significant. So what do we do? Kevin and I have, we made an offer on this in this private residence about three months ago. And we, well, on the way home, we thought, what do we do with it if we get it? I mean, do we fix the feet? Do we put them back the way we think they should? Uh, the paint is very similar, if not identical, to the paint on the piece. So it might be an old restoration. It could have been an old restoration. And so why probably 50 to 75% of chairs, early chairs are cut down and pieced up. Why was that done? That is an important thing. Completely untouched, original frame, original uh, dust on the back. <laughs> uh, but what you see with the painting, as the paintings were finished by the artist, they would be covered with a protective coat of varnish. And one thing that will happen over time with the varnish is that it'll start to turn yellow. And so particularly over on this part of the painting, you see a real yellowish developing in the sky into the landscape and giving an overall cast of yellow. It's really changing the intention of the artist. 
And if you compare that with the beautiful landscape scene on the back wall of the village of Niagara, uh, and you can see the difference. That painting has, has been conserved, has had the old varnish removed, and you see the clarity of the colors, the blue in the sky. So you're really conserving that, but you're all restoring it back to the original intention of the artist. And just to see that difference that that cleaning will make. And that's really going to improve the value on a painting. We want to leave our furniture as untouched as possible, but oftentimes it's really important to keep a, a painting clean. When pottery is fixed, it's very hard to hide the restoration. What they did is they fixed a crack and then they glazed the entire bottom with a new glaze. And eventually we have a loss of the later glaze because it didn't adhere, just like on the high board. Mm -hmm. And so what we have is a very rare plate, a PFAL, Pennsylvania PFAL, but the restoration is now becoming very evident mm -hmm. and it's starting to layer, is starting to peel. Unfortunately, it's lost its mushrooms, which is a very common restoration in these early chairs. Mm -hmm. These mushrooms, and that's what we call this, it shows the skill of the turner. Because they would start with a piece of wood. This is not a plot. This is all part of the one post. They would start and they would turn it down. Not many of them survive in really good condition. Most of them, the mushrooms have been cut off through the years. Even though we think that this could be one of the most early Rhode Island armchairs, it still has a flaw that is really a detriment. We store mushrooms, probably knock it down 50%. Uh, are, were the lakes cut down on it? It probably is, and that also is a restoration. But then there's always the question, see it's pieced up right here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And When you find something that has interest, that has a high degree of something that's interesting to you, and it's really on a personal level, go for it. Don't be afraid that it has restoration, you know. Be, be prepared that the price should match, you know, the, the restoration. And